Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Okay, so I'm going to talk about the type ins, and as uh, Alex pointed out last time, this lasted 40 minutes, so let's get started. So, yeah, type ins inside Python. Uh, just a caveat, there are going to be a few animal, cute animal pictures on the slides, mostly because this is kind of a hard subject, so it's easy to, it's nice to actually have it uh, wrapped up in some nice animals. Okay, so. Type ins was uh, laid, its foundation were laid down in this lovely pep by these lovely gentlemen and their other people implemented. Uh, the type in system in Python is mostly based on whatever MyPy dreamed up beforehand. Guido looked at it and liked it, so he made some adjustment to it, but it's heavily based on that. For any people who used MyPy before, type ins were inside the standard library, which happened just around the time with Python 3.5. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> Type in thing. So the first thing is, if in case you're still on Python 2, I have uh, bad news. The end of an era is here, so you might want to migrate. But that doesn't stop you from actually using type in thing, because you can lovely use it, because it has been backported via PyPy package to Python 2.7. So really, you, you don't have any excuse to not start using type in. Okay, so the first question is, why do it? So why do we need type in? I thought. Python is this lovely language, dynamic language, doesn't really need types. Why do we want still to add type hints? So, I'm going to present the reasons mostly in order of their importance. So, I think the first and biggest reason why you want type hints is it just makes the code a lot easier to understand than debug or maintain generally. So, the idea is that you know what your types are when you write the function, but if you come back two months down the line, you probably no longer remember what were the inputs and outputs for that function, for example. In this case, that Type in serves sort of like a nice speed up to catch up with the code. Okay? For example, in this case, you can easily see that the request data can really be anything, but for example, the headers must be like a dictionary of string, or the user ID must be uh, optional of user ID, where user ID means whatever someone defined it somewhere, so you have to look up what is an user ID still. But the ID should be able to help with locating that easily. And we also finally have a flag. The other thing is, it makes a lot easier refactoring, because being a dynamic language means that you don't really know where your objects are used inside your language. So it means it, when you refactor, you're not really sure if you refactor or you change all the places in your application where you actually need to change. Some ideas help some detection with it, but by having type in your code, the ID can be 100% in all the location where that object is actually used. The following reason is also related. Now you can actually make 100% correct suggestions. So if you're an ID developer, you're happy. If you're a library user, you're also happy because you now you actually know what type of function slash attributes do you have on an object and you don't have to read up the documentation on it. Okay, so just speeds up the development, makes development a lot easier. And the fourth reason in this is actually you can find type logical bugs by running some kind of linter, for example, MyPy, but there are other linters out there, okay? And the f another thing which is it actually helps improve the documentation, because now the documentation can be actually based on something which is checked and maintained, and not just some things which some, someone at some point wrote it in the documentation, but no one really updated since five years. Okay, and the Final reason what you can do with it is you actually can make a lot easier dive validations. For example, you can use PyDentic, which allows you to specify the types of your input objects, and you can do automatically this kind of checks with before, and you would have done with like an assert functions. In this case, you can basically make it just reuse the type in to ensure that your input parameters are whatever you made it by contract to be. Okay, so what it is not. So, it was actually stated that the type in thing in Python means to be not to be a few things. That doesn't stop anyone in Python to actually do it, but it's not designed to do that. One of these is no runtime type inference, meaning that the Python interpreter at runtime will not actually tell you what the types are. It basically or really tell you at runtime what the types are, but will not actually try to deduce what the types are at runtime. There will gonna be no informants. If you add type annotations, your code will not be faster. And also you can think of them as basically the interpreter treats them as comments, meaning I can discard it easily. It doesn't matter for executing the script or just the request. So generally, it is made to improve the developer experience, not to make your application better. I could argue that improving the developer experience makes happier developers, makes better applications, but that's like an indirect benefit of it. 
Okay, so the first thing, what kind of type, uh, what are type annotations? What kind of type information does it provide? Uh, the answer to this is gradual typing, meaning that it's an opt-in. You don't have to type into your entire application all at once. You can start type hinting just one single logic where you type in, and just that part of your code base is gonna be type checked, so to say. Okay, so gradual typing means that if you add it, only those places will actually be in. For example, in this case, the font may be a bit smaller, so I'm gonna slightly zoom in so people can actually see. You, you can actually see that in this case, for example, if you run the type until it will magically run that, hey, by the way, this doesn't make sense, you passed an invalid argument, or oh, also this property doesn't exist, maybe you mean something which exists, it's really closely, we can all see it's just a typo, okay? So, how to edit? This is the question, so if you wanna actually edit, what are your options, how you can actually edit inside your application? As always, there is more than one way of skinning the cat. The, the, the most uh, basic one is using the type annotations. Type annotation syntax is based on the PEP3170 function annotations and then later added variable annotations. These types are like, for example, given this function, these yeah, highlighted terms are the function annotation and this other one is the variable annotation. Basically meaning you can use the double dot to basically specify, by the way, I attach this additional information to this attribute or return value and those, this is it's this type. Okay, next up. Type annotations are the canonical and clean way. So these are the way they were designed, how they were actually meant to be used. They are packaging is solved because it's actually inside your code, so you don't need to actually think about how you package your type information with your application, but it does require Python 3.6. Uh, you can use Python 3.4 or 3.5 if you're willing to not have variable annotations, but the function annotations require at least 3.4, okay? So, one of the problems is requires importing all of the dependencies. For example, you see at that place we imported the list at the top of it. The other thing is it also requires um, evaluating this kind of, for example, in this case, there is a list int that actually is an object creation, so, or two, it doesn't, it's meant to be treated as comments at runtime at, in like Python 3.6, you actually have a runtime performance penalty, which true negligible, but still existent, because you need to do extra imports and extra object creations as the script first time loads. But that has been actually sort of say solved with Python 3.7. In Python 3.7, you can import from future annotations and once the interpreter sees this magical flag, oh, sorry, it will actually treat all those type information as comments and will actually not evaluate it as the script is loaded, okay? But you need Python 3.7. In Python 4, the mythical Python 4, this is gonna be the default. So type annotations will be by default not evaluated when the interpreter evaluates. It leaves it only for the type linter to actually do the evaluation, okay? So there are other ways to add it. One of the popular ways is using type comments. The good thing about type comments is that type comments were introduced in Python 1.0 or even before that, so it works on the ready Python version. The type information is still kept locally because you add your information right after the function or right beside the variable. The packaging is solved because you usually don't strip your comments from your packages and also the bad thing is kind of ugly because now you have all these type comments. Another bad thing is you now have a unused import. Remember in the previous time you have imports you used or you, imports you made, but you actually still used. In this case, because all those type information is in the comment, they're actually unused from the point of view of any linter. And also often comes with other linters. Adding comments is one of the main ways how various developer tools interact or add their own logic. For example, PyLint or Flake8 all do have options to turn off various checks by using this kind of comment, okay? So, the, what do I mean by kind of ugly? A lot of noise beside. Let's imagine this simple function. This function basically takes two variables and it swaps around inside the context manager those two variables, okay? It's fairly innocent, it just has like six lines. Let's add type information. Well, because you still want to keep the 80 line or 80 line column limit, you start splitting up in multiple sections, which means that now you actually have to add four extra lines just to add the type information alongside it. Then, 
you need to do the extra imports. Now you also need to various imports for all your types of referencing, which opens you up to the potential of having circular imports, which before and you might not have actually had. And then you also have to add various uh, disabled functions just to make the linter happy, which leaves you at the end of the day that ha from having just six readable line of code, now you have 16, a lot harder readable code. So yeah, it, it definitely adds an overhead once you add it. It makes the code a bit less readable, but on the other hand, I would just argue that all the information you add do make your life a bit easier, but definitely complicate the code base a bit more than otherwise would be. Uh, yeah, the downside it is that you have more lines of, uh, to actually maintain. This is only sounds good if you get paid by the number of lines you write. Okay, so the other option is you have interpret stuff files. Many other languages already invented this. Uh, if you wanna have some type information, some interface type information, you can just use stuff files. C++ is probably added this already in the last 40 years. So let's use this in Python too. The idea is that you can add the PyE information right alongside your file. And this works under any Python version. Now you can, you don't need to take, change the original source code. So it means you can add it without actually modifying your code. It also means that you can use the latest Python features because this interface file doesn't actually get checked. You can write on it by the actual interpreter. You can write any syntax you want in it, basically. So it means you can use the Python 3.7 features happily inside. No conflicts with other linter tools because the linters usually don't check the type uh, stuff files informations. And also it's well tested because basically if you already have used type hinting, this is how the, all the standard library is actually type hinted. Just by stuff files beside it and it's published under the project type shed. Type shed. Okay, the problem is you duplicated your card. Now you basically defined every definition you have twice. You have extra content to package, which is sort of solved by this additional path. What that means is that you need to pet, you need to package additional files with your application, which beforehand you did not have. So there is some downside there. And also, once specified, the source is ignored. So most of the type lint, how they treat it is basically once you have a stuff file, the stuff file is the golden standard. They don't care what is inside the actual source file, which opens you up to weird bugs once you actually, those two can diverge because someone, for example, updated the source file, but not actually the interface file. Okay, also there is no actual checking at the moment to actually do this, this match the stuff file against the source file. Also, can it look at variables because the stuff files only let you define the interface. Now, all this, I think I zoomed a bit too out. All this, there is a work in progress solution it. Uh, there is a work solution to be able to merge stuff files into source trees, which would bypass all the following, all the extra three problems at the end. Uh, with a little luck should be merged in MyPy in the next month or so. Okay. Doctrines. So doctrines basically are another way we specify it. This has been existed for all the time. The main problems with this is that there is no standard way to actually specify complex types. PyCharm defined its own way, or the Sphinx has its own way to define complex type. By complex types, I mean not a single type, by this or that type, or that kind of complex type definitions. It is tool dependent supports required in the documentation. The documentation is often not checked against the actual application code, which leaves you to open to easily deprecated code quickly, or like really out of date typings quickly. Okay, so what to add? So this is gonna be a quick introduction of what kind of type information you can add. The main one is the nominal types. Nominal types are basically your classes or your primitive types like int float. So these are basically you can have also like generic containers like tuple, list, iterable. You can alias type just in case you don't have to type that much if you use one of the types heavily. Or you can have distinct types, which basically just means that, by the way, this is a user ID. It is a type of int, but make sure that whenever I pass in an object to this, I don't mess up passing in an int instead of an actual user ID or that the other way around. Or you have the name tuples. The composer, which is like union or optional, or one of these, which allow you to specify complex types. And you can also actually define your functions. So if you want to have a, call, a callback function, you can even type into even that. And you also have generic, which basically means think of it as the list. A list is a generic type, meaning it contains some type of collection. 
Okay? You can do this also for your classes. And you also have finally the any, which is basically disabled type checking. Any means fall back to the old system of dynamic typing. Okay. The other way you can actually specify, and this is, I would argue, a bit more Pythonic, but not all the time best, is structural typing. This is the logic we have in Python that if it looks like a duck and it quirks like the duck, it is a duck. So meaning, in this case, we don't specify that, by the way, I want a class which uh, has this type. Instead, I say, I want some type which has this kind of function on it or this kind of ability on it. Okay, so these are called inside Python type ending protocols. So in this case, for example, you have a protocol which basically means I only want to be able to get, use, uh, it's a generic type and it has a getter and it will always return the string. Any type which satisfies this requirement is good for my function, okay? So this allows you to have even more generic definitions of types. Okay, so gotcha. So once you start to actually add your type information, you decide that what type of information you add, you decide that if you're gonna be either a nominal or a gradual type. The next question is, okay, or the next thing you wanna run into is some kind of gotchas, meaning some kind of edge cases, which makes you think like, uh, okay, it was nice not to have to think about before I had types. So one of these is, for example, there is a, if you have Python for both, or if you have a code which needs to run both on Python 2 and 3, you need to know that the string or the presentation function always returns a string, where the string means different thing under Python 2 and 3. Which means that this simple uh, function definition, if you start type hinting, actually becomes this lot more complicated one. And this is the magic mainly needed because now you actually have to return different type under different Python versions. For example, once you use the from future import Unicode literals, you basically now have to add runtime logic to actually check that ensure that whenever you return, it's actually bytes under Python 2 and it's actually a Unicode string under Python 3. So it adds a bit of obfuscation to the problem. The other thing is multiple return types. So imagine you write a function which basically multiplies the thing. So basically it takes either a string or an int and it returns basically the same. The question is, if you, work on it for, if you write it in this order and you write it with a number, you're gonna quickly realize that that number is actually that can, the response can be either string and int the way you defined, and now you actually have to assert that by the way the response is int if the input is int. This kind of thing is the way the int type shed is often solved by basically adding this any, which means disable the checks on the return value, which is of course kind of depicts the purpose. A better way you can do is now you have this overload complex. Overload means that for this given type, always this given type is returned. So in this case, I can specify for int, always int will be returned. For string, always string will be returned. Now obviously, the, now you don't need to add any assertions when you call it, but the downside is that now you define the same function three times, which means that the linter will not be happy. it will be like, what are you doing? Why do you define your functions? Okay, the third one is the way the type lookup looks inside the linting logic. It's basically if you define this function, for example, a function has various types and you want to provide quick properties which return the correct type. For example, it can take a float so the user can just call the float property. Once you run this on the checker, the linter is going to complain that invalid type test a.flat and you'll be like, what? I really did not define their test.a.flat. I just say this a float return value. And the reason is once you start Googling what the hell is up, the, you're gonna look up to this issue, which basically means that the lookup always happens to the closest namespace. Meaning, when the, pi, the linter wants to check for a given type, it starts to look at the inner logic, or like it starts to look where you defined it and go one namespace level up, up until it finds something that matches. Once it looks at the float, it says, okay, I have a float. Oh, it's a function, I don't really care. It's still, I got a float, I'm just gonna reintroduce that. So the way to actually solve this problem is you specify it, I really mean the built-in float, not any other fault you may be able to find, but now you actually import this built-in thing. One uh, caveat that this typing, the type checking is something which is, uh, is uh, only interpreted, this is always uh, true inside the linter and always false inside the interpreter. So you can use this to guard to execute logic only for one in environment or the other, okay? So the fourth one are contrarian arguments types, the fourth gotcha. This basically means that if you define, for example, a base class which handles all the world, and then you want to have specialized classes which handle only a part of the world. For example, in this case, the base class treats both int and strings, but I have a specialized class which treats only with strings and one which treats only with, with uh, 
int. Once you type into you run the type into, you're going to find a this link to a super type. This basically means that whatever you do, you cannot have this kind of thing. You can only extend your type information in your derived class. You cannot constrain it. For example, this would be happily running. If I had, I'd say, my children handles even more than the parent, that's completely fine. But in the type hinting logic, it makes no sense to constrain it, which can go against if you probably, it's quite often, people tend to have this kind of abstraction that try to specialize a given type of implementation for a given subset. Okay, the fifth gotcha is basically compatibility, meaning that let's imagine we have this runtime. We have just a base class which has a magic, it's a class method, then we derive from it, and then we try to run it. Anyone see what the problem with this? So the problem with this is actually that once you try to run it, this will happily fail, because for example, someone could easily specify that the, they want any type of A, and they want A, so it can put in a B also in the list of this, and once you run this log, it will actually fail, because for example, the B magic uh, constructor cannot take that single type of, uh, cannot complete with actually having a non-optional argument, okay? So this means that whenever you have your functions, you can only also only enrich the function. You cannot constrain to not run. So like it's the children must always satisfy the parents' requirements, so to say. So the obvious solution to this one is that you actually need to make the second argument optional. And now everything will work. Okay, now let's just turn, turn this thing around. Let's move basically this class method into an init. It's basically the same. I just move from a class method to an init. Uh, so if you run this one with the linter, or if you turn with runtime, it will still fail at runtime. If you run it with the linter, the linter will say that. Yeah, it's, it's correct, it's, it will say nothing. It'll say everything's fine. And the reason for this inconsistency is because the linter developers created, it's too common to prohibit incompatible init and new things. This is just a slight caveat that you can, if your typing thing is correct, you can still have incorrect runtime code even from a typing point of view, because they started to not break too much code when they introduced this kind of logic. Okay, so I think this is the general consensus. Once you start adding type int, you sort of get at some point at this point. So, type inting, once you add type inting, it's not trivial. But don't despair. You can take out always the bigger hammer. And by bigger hammer, you mean you can use the reverse type function to see whatever my pi thinks the type is. And when you don't agree with its deduction, you can use the cat to force something that you have. This is just a simple function you can use to actually force a given type to the linter. And you can also, when you gave up all hope, you're just like, okay, I don't want to really solve this typing problem. You can just always place the type ignore comment and say that this, I just don't want to deal with it. Okay, so one extra thing which I'm gonna do in one, it is possible to actually merge your duct string at typing. Uh, typing. You can use basically a Sphinx plugin, which means that if you annotate, instead of annotating your duct strings like this, you can basically move it inside the, by using the Sphinx plugin inside your application. And once you add the, install the plugin and install, enable the extension, you can have to that kind of type into the information, automatically inject your type information in your documentation, okay? So, uh, what's next for MyPy, which is one of the most popular linters? The major thing is performance. Oh wait, that already has been done. So, there has been introduced a daemon, which basically means that now you can run your type int information even faster. It will define an API and plugin system, so people can extend it. It will stretch type in information with even more popular libraries, so we have even more good type ins, and it will offer you the option to merge stops and type, in type source trees. Okay, and finally, when do you want to use it? I think you should think of them as the tests. Whenever you want to write a test, you should also add type ins. Type ins are basically just tests which actually, tests which actually, instead of writing unit tests for it, you use the linter to check the same time of that the contract is met. Okay, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Has anybody got uh, one quick question they would like to ask? Hi. Um, because a lot of applications nowadays handle JSON blobs, 
Uh, yeah. Is there any kind of way to ensure that the JSON blob has certain properties or that certain attributes of the JSON blob are a string or a number? Or something. There, there is. You can specify that you want. If you think of them as a dictionary, which had a different contract, you can have defined that. You can say, for example, this is going to be a dictionary, where at this key is going to be as this type. So that is possible. You cannot define a generic JSON type, though. Like that's not possible. Uh, Guido tried it, and then just gave up. Basically, said it's impossible to actually, without having infinite recursion, it's impossible to define a JSON type. Okay, but you can define keys having cool. given type. Thank you very much, Perla. Uh, that's all we've got time for. Uh, Ivan's Thank up you. next at 11.15. Uh,